In our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for this freedom that we're enjoying where we can come together as believers without persecution. We pray you go forward with us this evening in your word. Make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're studying the doctrine of love and our next section brings up a question. And that is, how can perfect God love sinful man? And so you end up with a problem that has to be solved. There is a problem in God loving fallen man. He's totally depraved. Uh, one of the uh, cartoons that we watched growing up was Charlie Brown. And uh, on Charlie Brown, there were lots of... Uh, different personalities you know Snoopy he was the dog and Woodstock was the little pet bird and um, it was always uh, and Linus he was kind of the brains of the operation and uh, Sally she was kind of a boyish girl and uh, but there was another character named Pigpen and if you ever watched Charlie Brown you saw that Pigpen they they tried to draw the smell that was coming off of him by having little lines kind of like dust. and uh, But he was supposedly smelled bad. Well, that's totally depraved man. Totally sinful. He is, uh, he, he is to, to the perfect righteousness of God, he cannot pass. He just, he has no chance. And so... The Bi but we so we have a problem in that the Bible says God so loved the world. So how did He do that? Is the question. How did God love sinful, totally depraved, fallen man? How did He get around His perfect righteousness, examining depraved man? How did He come to the point of loving fallen man? And so. Uh, the first thing I want you to do is turn in your Bible to Leviticus 16. You're going all the way back to the front of it. Leviticus 16. We're going to see under the Mosaic Law, the Day of Atonement, Day of Atonement, and God prescribes the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. And at the first of the chapter, you get, you get a, a description here of how exact were the guys supposed to be that fulfilled this uh, ritual. Look what happened here in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered a profane fire before the Lord and died. In other words, they built an alt a fire on the altar and they didn't do it correctly. They breached protocol. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And so we know that in the tabernacle at that time, there was the holy place and there was the holy of holies. And inside the holy of holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm going to show on the camera the picture on the front of this book and you can see it. Uh, here's the Ark of the Covenant and the two cherubim on top of the Ark. And so this was inside of the Holy of Holies 
And then the Shekinah glory of God dwelled inside the holy place. It was a ball of fire or a cloud of smoke about the size of a man's head, and that was the presence of God inside the Holy of Holies. Now, he goes on and says in verse 3, Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And he goes on and, and goes through some of the protocol of getting ready. I want to go through... And I'm going to skip some of that because I want to go down to verse 14 to get to the part I really want you to see tonight. We're looking at the ritual of the Day of Atonement. And then you're going to take the high priest and he is going to be pre he's going to prepare himself because he's going to wash his hands and his feet. He's going to put his uniform on. He's going to operate clean from his priesthood, if you will. And it says uh, in verse 14, He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat. Now I want to show you the picture once again. This is the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat is the lid right here on the top. Now what was in the Ark? Do you all remember? Don't say it out loud. I, she's got it. Uh, you all all got it. What was in the Ark? There were three different things in the Ark. Because I'm going to, uh, young people, you have a learn, learning moment. I'm going to get you all to answer next time I ask the question. There were three items in the ark. First, there was Aaron's staff, Aaron's staff that budded, and that was divinely delegated authority that God handed down to man. He said, now this is your leader. You listen to him and you follow. And what did man do? He rejected the authority that God delegated. Then there was a jar of manna, God's provision, his perfect food. If you ate it, you'd, you really didn't get old. You know, it... You had you stayed in perfect health, and uh, it was a wonderful, perfect food. It had everything you need to keep your body going in the desert and and keep on trucking. What what did man do? He rejected God's perfect provision, His grace provision, and they wanted the flesh pots of Egypt, and they wanted the uh, quail, and so they rejected His perfect provision. And then what else was in there? The Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone. And what did God, uh, man do? He broke the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What did they do while he was on the top of the mountain getting the first tablets? They built the golden calf. And by the time he got down, man, they'd already just breached, a terrible breach there. And so God, he placed those three things inside the Ark of the Covenant the authority they rejected, his grace provision they rejected, and the Ten Commandments that they broke. And then you had the two angels who were mounted to the top of the Ark of the Covenant. One of the angels uh, represented God's perfect righteousness. And when God's righteousness looked down into the Ark of the Covenant, it saw what? Man's sinfulness in all three areas. And then God's justice was represented in the other angel, and it was looking down, and what, what God's righteousness rejects, guess what his justice does? It judges. And so you're in trouble, aren't you? You're a totally fallen, sinful man. You've rejected God in three different areas, and here's his perfect righteousness and his perfect justice looking down at our failures. And here's where you have the Day of Atonement. Look, let's read what happens. He shall take some of the blood of the bull, we're reading out of verse 14, and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat. On the east side and before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Now, when the, when the priest came in, remember that he had a bowl of blood and there was no door going into the Holy of Holies, he had to slide the bowl of blood under the curtain and then he had to come in himself. What did God see first? Did he see the priest of the blood? He saw the blood. That's the only way we'll go into the presence of God is because the blood of Christ allows us to do that. It cleanses us from sin. And then when he got down on his knees and crawled under the curtain, that's genuine humility. See, nobody's going to march up before God and stake their claim. 
It is only in the, hu the attitude of humility that we can approach God on the basis of the sacrifice of Christ. You get it? No one, it, the Bible says, by grace we are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. There will be no boasting in heaven of how you got there except what Christ did for you. He take, he, he, once he's inside, he stands, he takes the bowl of blood, he sprinkles on top of the mercy seat. Now watch what happens. The, the righteousness of God was looking down and seeing man's sinfulness. And the justice of God was just waiting to swing into action. But guess what the, the priest did? Seven times he sprinkled blood. And now what does God's righteousness see? It sees the blood of Christ, which covers man's sin. And so on the day of atonement, it says the word for atonement is kafar. It means covering until Christ could come and die on the cross God's righteousness was satisfied in the blood, the, the ritual that portrayed the work of Christ on the cross. And so it, it goes on, it says, Then he shall kill the goat of sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement, or kafar, covering for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions, for all their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. That means the total depravity of man. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make the atonement in the holy, of pl holy place until he comes out, that he make, may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord, and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull, and some of the blood of the goat, and put it on the horns of the altar and all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on, its, on, on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And so this is the ritual of the Day of Atonement. Have Once a year, it was called the covering. It was where God would be, he would be propitiated. That, that, that's a big theological term that means the satisfaction of the righteousness of God. He would pass over once again until Christ could come. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at the real thing. You've got to turn all the way over towards the back. Hebrews 9. Excuse me, Hebrews 9. So, the Old Testament ritual was a shadow of the reality that was to come. Now, Christ was the reality. Hebrews 9, Then indeed, even the first covenant, that's the Mosaic law, had the ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, that was the tabernacle eventuating in the temple. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, the shellbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. That's the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant sat. Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid all, on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing shadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. In other words, there was so much doctrine involved in each piece, each article of the tabernacle. He says, I'd have to write a whole other book in order to explain it. So I'm just going to skip over all these doctrines and I'm going to go right to the point. 
Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services, but into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year. That was the Day of Atonement. Not without blood. See that? Not without it. Which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. In other words, he's saying all of this was shadow Christology. It was a shadow of the real thing to come. And now we have the actual historical event. Verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. And he's going to say in verse 11, it's happened. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. In other words, Aaron was a picture, a shadow of Christ. Jesus never went into the Holy of Holies while he was here in the 33-year uh, dispensation of the hypostatic union, but he was the high priest. What, watch where he did go. Watch this. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. In other words, he's talking about the third heaven. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all. Now this means his sacrifice. He didn't have a bowl of his own blood. He was in resurrection body. This means that he came into the Holy of Holies having the three-hour period of time on the cross where he died spiritually in the judgment of the sins of the world. That's the blood of Christ. But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purity of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works. That means they shouldn't go back to temple worship to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. In other words, the Old Testament sacrifices, offerings, and rituals were all the shadow rituals that portrayed what Christ would actually do when he came. And it didn't matter that Jesus never went into a building called the temple on earth. He went into the third heaven, having sacrificed himself on the cross for the free hour period of time in which he made, he paid the sin debt, if you will, and entered into the third heaven. And guess what? The righteousness of God was there. The justice of God was there. And they were propitiated satisfied with the work of Christ on the cross. So, here's the question we've, we're, we're coming to again. What is, how in the world did God love sinful man? So we're going to answer the question now, having reviewed atonement and propitiation. So point A, because God is absolute righteousness and justice, it is impossible for God to love <coughs> sinful man without compromising the holiness of his essence. God cannot love sinful man. He can only judge him. So why are we not a pile of ash? Why are we not a little smoking pile of ash is the question. 
Therefore, when John 3, 16 says that God so loved the world, it demands that God's righteousness and justice remain uncompromised. It's a biblical fact that God loves sinful man, and therefore we must look for some way in which God has resolved the problem. How did he resolve the problem? We just looked at it. How, did, how can God look at sinful man and say, I love you? Because we are like pig pen. We're totally depraved. We're like filthy rags in his sight. Repugnant to his righteousness. Point C. Did y'all get those notes? I need to go back. You okay? Point C. God cannot love on a sentimental or emotional basis. It would compromise his holiness. In other words, he doesn't look down and say, oh, that one's cute, like you do in the puppy store, the pet store. Or, look, that one's got such a great personality. Or, look, that one does so much work for me. See, it's absolute righteous standard. And I told you about how God measures. He you know, we measure and we think we're great and good. I told you about during the space race, you know, NASA got really high and mighty and we, we, we came up with some new tools to create some really uh, modern equipment to go to the moon. And uh, there was a lot of math and a lot of chemistry, but there was a lot of machining that happened too. And that, that happens to be my industry. And we, <clears throat> we had to make a valve to go inside one of these Apollo rockets that was going to divert uh, air fluid. I can't remember what it was. It had to have some tiny passages in it. And uh, so the NASA team, they actually built a, a drill bit that you couldn't see with the naked eye. You had to have a microscope to see this drill bit, to drill into metal to create these passages. And, man, we thought we were great. So... Uh, we packaged up a couple of these drill bits and we sent them to Germany because Germany has always been the forefront of machining technology. They've been years ahead of anything we could ever do. And, you know, when we finally got the Industrial Revolution over here, we made leaps and uh, bounds in our machining technology. And we really thought that we had something. And so we sent some of our drill bits over to Germany to show them off. And it wasn't but about a month later that the package of drill bits came back. And the uh, machine shop guys unpacked them and they looked at them. And our drill bit had a hole drilled in it. The Germans were ahead of us. See, that's our righteousness compared to God's. My ways are higher than your ways. In Isaiah 55. So... We, we cannot discount that God's righteousness would never accept sinful man, and it will not accept us on the basis of us being cute, spectacular, scintillating, having great personality, or great workers. God's love is no stronger than righteousness, than his own righteousness, and this is true of human beings as well. Young ladies, you always beware of the wolf that uh, wants to compliment you in every way. His love is no better than his own integrity. So point E, the true basis for love is always righteousness, character, honor, or integrity. Someone who truly loves you won't really say it unless they truly do because they know that is a strong word. Very strong. Love really means sacrifice when you compare it to the love of God. And Man, the Bible commands us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Well, the whole idea of his love towards the church is that he had to buy her. You see, 
salvation is free. It didn't cost you anything, but it cost somebody a lot. And so we recognize that the kind of love that we are commanded towards our wives is a sacrificial type of love. And so many, uh, I, I don't know that too many men get that because they want to be recognized for all the things they're doing for their family or for their spouse, but that's the sacrifice. You are working to make their life easy and that sometimes it's hard on you and you are working to make it where they are going to have a long, happy, and fulfilled life and that uh, your responsibility is to your wife and to your children in a sacrificial way, well, that is no better than your own integrity. And there are many a man who had very low integrity who have left their wives or left their children and gone off to a new life that was easier or what have you because they had no integrity. And so you see now that the true basis for love is integrity. Point F, therefore, Jesus Christ had to go to the cross to bear our sins, not only to bear our sins, but to propitiate or to protect the righteousness of God. Now you get the idea. When God says, I love you, sinful man, there is a screen of the blood of Christ that he is looking at sinful man through. Here's the way I can love you, propitiation. The blood of Christ. And without the blood of Christ, God cannot love us. And uh, in Romans 5, 8, it even tells us that God's love was on display, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's your verse. He had to go to the cross not only to bear our sins, but to propitiate. That means to satisfy or protect the righteousness of God the Father in loving the world. That frees the Father to love the world and still not compromise His righteousness and His justice. So for God to love the world, it costs God the Father a great deal more than we realize. In 1 John 2, 2, it says that Christ not only died for those who would believe, but for everyone, unlimited atonement. And that means that God can love those who hate him. He can love the unbeliever. He can love anyone. Uh, even as he loved Saul. Saul, Saul, why, why dost thou persecute me? Remember that? God loved him. Point G, because Christ was perfect in his deity and humanity on the cross, God the Father is propitiated, his righteousness uncompromised, and the way is paved for God to love the world. So the filter through which God views The unbelieving world is the blood of Christ. And without that filter, God could never love totally depraved man. Born age, therefore, propitiation makes it possible for God to save man and love the believer with maximum love. When, I, when you and I come to the cross and believe in Christ, we pass the point of propitiation. Now, that's a phrase given to us by the colonel. But we're reliant upon propitiation as unbelievers to make it to the foot of the cross. Otherwise, totally depraved man would be a pile of ash. Then we find ourselves believing in Christ. 
there's my Savior. There's the only way to get into heaven is his sacrifice. I know I'm not good enough to get there. I know I need Christ, and therefore I'm trusting in him. I'm trusting in his sacrifice as the way to approach God. There's where you pass the point of propitiation. Now here's something interesting happens. Point I. At the point of salvation, every believer receives the imputation of plus R. Whereby God loves that believer with maximum love and without compromising his essence. So as an unbeliever, God loved you, but it was looking through the filter of the screen of the sacrifice of Christ, the blood of Christ, and that's the only way he could keep intact his integrity was to say, I love you, and there is the work of Christ shielding his integrity. But now as a believer, guess what happens? He looks and sees you, and he sees his very own righteousness. Now something has changed. See, he still loves you, but now it's personal love because you have something of his, plus R. And at the very moment you believed, you were accredited to your account was God's own righteousness, says Romans 4. So now that is the point of attraction. And that is where all blessing is directed towards as a believer, his own righteousness. That also means that after salvation, we can, uh, it doesn't matter how hard we work for God, that's not his point of attraction. It doesn't matter how much we give, that's, how, that's not God's point of approbation, his attraction. It doesn't matter how scintillating a personality, how great a testimony we cultivate, <clears throat> God is looking down at you, and the point of a blessing is directed right towards his own righteousness. You see, that insulates. It. You can't work to approbate God even after salvation. In addition to the imputation of plus R, the church age believer has positional truth. That means in the, in the top circle, That guarantees every member of the royal family of God will be loved with the same amount of love that God the Father has for God the Son. 1 John 3, 2 and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so now we've looked at three different flavors of God's love, haven't we? We've looked at the love of God directed towards the unbeliever. We've looked at the love of God directed towards the believer and the grace pipeline. And now we've seen positional truth where you're in union with Christ and God loves you because he loves his son. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one I quote to you every time we do the Lord's table. For He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him, top circle, union with Christ. So, point L. This means that God loves the carnal believer as much as the spiritual believer. God loves the reversionist as much as the super grace believer. God loves the believer influenced by evil as much as the believer influenced by doctrine. This is grace. This is divine love. That's the whole story of the prodigal son. What happened? The prodigal son received his inheritance and he went out and lived a riotous life, riotous living. He wasted his inheritance. But the other brother stayed home, didn't he? 
And then finally a famine came and the kid began to starve and he did feign for the pods the swine did eat. And uh, he finally came to his senses and he said, at my father's house, there, my, my father's servants have more than enough to eat. I shall go and beg him for a job. And uh, he, he was going to confess to him his, uh, his sins. And what happened? The father saw him coming back home from afar off. He was waiting for him. He was looking for him. And he ran to meet him, and he fell and kissed him on the neck, gave him the golden ring for his finger, a clean robe, killed the fatted calf. See, there's divine love to the carnal reversionist believer. Smelled like a pig. God loved him. But what happened to the brother that stayed at home? He got jealous. And uh, so this is the, the moral of the story is don't be self-righteous, high and mighty while you're at home with God in fellowship. You know how people get to like look down their nose at others who are in a faraway land. Well, the, the best thing you can do is giggle and say the famine is coming for you, brother. Uh, I've been there. And uh, don't get high and mighty like the brother who stayed home and get uh, sour grapes and things of that nature when the, the carnal believer comes home. And so God loves the carnal believer and the super grace believer. That's grace. So we've seen how, how does God love man even though he is totally depraved. We saw that not only that propitiation was involved, but that the blood of Christ is the filter, the screen that God the Father looks to totally, de he looks through that filter at totally depraved humanity and says, I love you this much. I sacrificed my own son. Then when you become a believer, he looks down and he says, I love you with a personal love. You have my own righteousness. And then for the church age believer in union with Christ, he sees you and you're dunked right there in Christ. You're baptized into him. I love you just as much as I love my son. You're in union with him. And while they're all divine love, you see the categories of how that works works there and how his integrity is it remains intact there's no breach and even if we get out of line God has love for us and uh, you just have to chuckle because for the carnal believer God loves them so much he doesn't want them to stay in a faraway land forever so what does he do he encourages them to come home and get back in fellowship with me, uh, him. And, and, and what does this, the believer in the faraway land, what do they continue to say? My life is terrible. I can't believe all these bad things are happening to me. Why are all these bad things happening to me? And you're going, I wish you'd get back to Bible class. We're having a great time at Bible class. Man, I'd love for you to be there. I'm cooking barbecue. You ought to come eat with us. Pay for Bible class. Do everything you can. And what do you do? Next time you see them, man, my life just keeps on getting worse. Man, you ought to get back to Bible class. I don't know how much longer you can stand it. You see, God loves them so much, he'll do anything in the world to get them back in his plan and his will instead of taking them home early. And their life just continues to get worse and worse because God is encouraging them to get back to the one and only source of blessing in this life as a believer, and that's Bible doctrine. You cannot do what you do not know, and doctrine teaches us how to live the spiritual life. So, we're studying the doctrine of love, and we found out tonight how does God love fallen, totally depraved man? How does God love 
the believer with his own imputed righteousness and then how does God love the church age believer in union with Christ and even the believer who's out of fellowship he sends Charlie Grace discipline all right we're going to move on to a new a new section here in our verse Paul says the purpose of the commandment or preaching is love and what he's saying is is that the hearers ought to be developing capacity for love in other words Timothy the point of your preaching ought to be that your congregation ought to be developing capacity for love and did you know we're all commanded to love God the Bible tells us that we are supposed to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. How do we do that is the question. And the answer is learn doctrine. And once we begin to learn all God has done for us, our capacity to love him grows. When you go into the ideas of how God plan for our lives and imputed soul life to us and he calculated all of these blessings into time just for us specifically for us and now that every day God has planned a new gift of grace for you you can't st you can't help but be in awe for all that God has done and that's how you love him so we're going to look at Category one, love, under phileo love, and that's directed towards God. So we're going to look at a definition here. Category phileo love comes in three categories. This is called personal love, phileo love. The first category is towards God. The second is towards your mate, right man, right woman, whoever you're married to. And the third is your friends. In addition, there is an obligatory relaxed mental attitude towards all members of the royal family of God, better known as loving the brethren. Category one is the believer's capacity to love God and respond to God's love based on Bible doctrine resident in the soul. When the believer reaches maturity, known as super grace status, this category one love is called occupation with the person of Christ. The command to category one love is found in Deuteronomy 6.5 as an expression of worship. And obviously Jesus was asked what's the most important commandment and he, he gave them and he said, you know, you need to love God and you need to love people. And... Uh, then he goes on and he says, you will, you will know my followers, my disciples, because they love one another. And so that's uh, the highest Christian virtue is love, and it is a uniform that you get to wear. So we're really going to look at category one here, love directed towards God. This is what Paul he uh, told Timothy, you preach and you develop their capacity to love God. So point two, the means of category one love. Since God is invisible and since at the same time he is the object of category one love, we, need, we must see and love God through his word. In other words, you cannot see God, and therefore ordinary means of love is out. 
that is Bible doctrine resident in the soul that makes it possible for us to love God. The reversionistic believer, for example, is incapable of loving God because he lacks the basic ingredients, doctrine in the soul. The immature believer does not love God because he lacks doctrine in the soul. And while for different reasons they do not love God, nevertheless the fact remains. You cannot love God unless you know God. And you cannot know God unless you have Bible doctrine resident in your soul. Now I think that phrase could, uh, that's an axiom if you will. And if you had something to underline in your notes, that would be the phrase tonight. You cannot love God unless you know God. You cannot know God unless you have Bible doctrine resident in your soul. You cannot have Bible doctrine resident in your soul unless you're positive towards doctrine. Our command, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and putting yourself under the authority of your right pastor teacher. Without this, it is impossible to love God. 1 Peter 1.18 Jesus Christ is invisible. And to love the invisible God requires more than a lot of emotional nonsense. It requires doctrine in the soul. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. Well, that's true. God has designed some wonderful blessing for us, and without doctrine, we wouldn't know about any of it. The idea that uh, the church age doesn't even have to exist is a big point for me. Uh, we, we don't even have to be here, but God in His grace designated this entire dispensation to complement Jesus Christ's strategic victory on the cross and his third royal title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He says, you have a royal family as divinity. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. You have a royal family as the as the uh, Son of David. You have uh, Jewish believers and Jewish royalty. You have a royal family. But under your third royal patent that you won at the cross, you have no royal family. You see, because he won the strategic victory, he claimed the title of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he had no royal family. So God the Father intercalated the church age. It's been running 2,000 years just to form a new royal family to complement Jesus Christ's strategic victory on the cross. And so grace, we exist in grace. We don't have to be here. You see the story, the uh, story of the king who was going to have a celebration and he sent mes messengers go out and invite people to my feast and they treated the messengers badly and beat them up and sent them back and then he said well maybe if I send my son to invite them to my feast they will come and they abused and killed the son and what did he say 
Go out into the byways and the highways and the ditches and invite anybody and everybody you can see to come. That's you. God found you in the ditch, in the byway, in the lowest part. You See, you weren't even intended to be there. But because Israel rejected Jesus Christ as a whole, God went out into the byways into the ditches and invited you to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We don't even see we don't have to be here, but we are in God's grace. And every day we wake up, you need to remember that God has planned from eternity past every footstep of your day and every blessing that we come in contact with. And it didn't have to exist. He did it out of grace. And so we're going to start studying the category one love under phileo love and how to love God. And Paul tells Timothy the purpose of the commandment or preaching is love. And that means to develop the capacity for love on the behalf of the congregation. In other words, you've got to teach them enough doctrine so that they can begin to love God. And how do we do that? We find out all he has done for us. And we stand in awe, in amazement of his grace. Well, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance tonight. We'll continue in the doctrine of love next Wednesday. And I hope that uh, you also can be here Sunday morning for our study in Ephesians. Okay, I'm going to pray with you. We'll do a roll call and be dismissed. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to find out all that you have done for us. And we stand in awe, Father, that you would think of us, little old us from eternity past, and make a personal life for us where you pour out your grace in every moment of our existence. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.